So now I'd like to introduce our, our guest speaker of the evening, Dr. Peter Hotez of Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Hotez has uh, served a vital role on sharing evidence-based science with the public throughout the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Hotez is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and we'll be talking to him about his role as a science communicator, the work to develop and deploy the COVID-19 vaccines and preparing for the next pandemic. At the end of our interview, uh, which David and I will uh, co-host, we'll have time for a few questions. And so we'll also ask you to either put it in the chat function or your mic will be open to ask uh, Peter a question uh, directly. So with that, uh, Peter, uh, this is Amelie. And one of the first questions that we have for you is, will you share with us your assessment of the vaccine rollout in Texas and Texas response to the pandemic at, uh, at, at the state level? And where do you see things stand now? Well, thanks so much. First of all, uh, greetings to everyone and happy new year. Um, so sorry, we're not doing this in person, but uh, we'll make that the aspirational goal for next year. And I have some optimism that that will happen. And just thank you for all your work uh, that, that's, that everyone is doing at Tamas to continue science during this very challenging year of uh, 2020. Um, you know, right now, the, the, just in terms of the epidemic, it's, things are pretty rough here in the state of Texas. We're going to be approaching 2 million uh, confirmed cases. And remember, that's an underestimate by a factor of four or five. So we're, we could be looking at upwards of nine or 10 million cases in the state of Texas to you know, a fourth or a third of the state's population already infected. And you know, the lead headline in the Houston Chronicle this morning was uh, 30,000 deaths. So that's just a horrible benchmark. And you know, that's one of the greatest losses of life we've had in our state. We lost around 20,000 Texans in, who gave their life in World War II and uh, estimates of three to 20,000 during the Civil War and 8,000 in the Galveston flood. So we are looking at something of epic proportions. And we've missed some opportunities to contain or control the COVID-19, and we can address that at the Q&A. And the bottom line now is we're backed into a corner and forced to vaccinate our way out of this situation. That may be our last uh, hope in terms of interrupting virus transmission. And our estimates with a group at City University of New York says we have to vaccinate about 75% of the Texas population. So if uh, roughly assuming 30 million people in the state of Texas, 24 million people that we have to vaccinate, you know, the back of the envelope calculation says if we're gonna do this over eight months, we're gonna have to vaccinate 3 million Texans uh, every month now from now until end of August or September. It's a, it's a pretty high bar when you think about it, 100,000 Texans uh, every day. and some will require two doses. So, you know, 150, 200,000 Texans every day. So the rollout has gone slowly in the beginning, which we knew. Uh, the question is, how do we get up to speed? Can we get to that very high benchmark of 100, 200,000 Texans every, every day? And, and, and I don't know the answer to that. It's going to uh, be incredibly challenging. I, I don't think we're going to be able to do this with the current health system in place, uh, relying heavily on pharmacies. And uh, even though I think the pharmacies are doing a good job and, and, and let's face it, I, most of us get our adult vaccines at pharmacies, but the problem is vaccinating 24 million Texans is not gonna happen with everybody calling around to HEB, Kroger's and Randall's and seeing if uh, they have vaccine available for your mom or dad or brother or sister. We've gotta have something more in depth in place. And I've been a big proponent of opening up some larger venues to supplement the pharmacies uh, and the medical centers. Also making some of the rules uh, and the gatekeeping criteria a little less stringent because you know, we've learned nationally that we don't do well with complexity. Uh, we just can't manage a lot of complexity almost. You know, I'd love to pick the brain of some of the engineers in Tamas because it's almost like a systems engineering problem in, in many ways. Uh, how, do you, how do you do this at such a high throughput level? And lastly, we're going to need additional vaccines. Uh, I don't think the mRNA technology 
is sufficiently robust uh, to do the job in terms of ability to scale up production. They're good vaccines in two doses, but making sufficient quantities, uh, we're gonna need some of the other technologies, the adenovirus vaccines, the um, uh, particle vaccines, and of course we have a recombinant protein vaccine. Hey, Peter, this is David. Thanks so much for being with us today. I have to tell you, I had an enormous smile on my face about two weeks ago when I sat down to read my Dallas Morning News and saw that you, the editorial board named you as a finalist for Texan of the Year. That's a pretty unusual feat for a scientist, but I uh, was just so pleased and so happy uh, to see that recognition of the work you're doing and the, the voice that you're sharing with us. So I know that you uh, not only comment on other people's work, but you have a, a, an enormous vaccination uh, research program at your own institution under, with your team. So tell us about the work you're doing and uh, where you think that might lead. Well, thanks. Yeah, I was thrilled to get that Texan of the Year finalist because now I finally felt like a real Texan because uh, <laughs> we moved, we moved, from, I'm from the Northeast, I'm from Connecticut. We moved about 10 years ago to be, you know, part of Texas and that amazing uh, medical center and uh, Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine. It's been, you know, I, uh, people are often surprised back east. I tell them these 10 years have been the most productive period of my scientific and professional life. And, and, uh, and they don't, uh, don't quite get it uh, until you're down here and spending time here, you often don't. But, you know, the move to Texas actually uh, coincided with are adopting a coronavirus vaccine program. And we did it because we like to pride ourselves on saying we make the vaccines no one else cares about. We make parasitic disease vaccines for the world's poorest people for diseases like Chagas disease and schistosomiasis and leishmaniasis. And for similar reasons, we adopted a coronavirus vaccine program working with a group of scientists at the New York Blood Center who had a great eye concept for making coronavirus vaccines targeting the spike protein of the virus. And even though we're not virologists, we thought it was compelling enough. We wrote to the NIH, got a good size grant funded and started making uh, uh, SARS-1 and MERS coronavirus vaccines when few people cared about it. And then when the Chinese put up the COVID-19 sequence on BioArchive in uh, January, you know, we had already figured out how to, we knew what the spike protein target was. We knew the receptor binding domain component was critical. We knew how to deliver the spike protein and, and, and we weren't alone. Other groups of scientists were. And, and then it was a matter of plug and play, all of our technologies now adapting it to the specific COVID-19 uh, virus uh, sequence. And, and that little piece of history is important because so much of the concern about COVID-19 vaccines is saying they're rushed or not at, you know, that all this uh, popped up in a few months. It's, it's not the case. I think what you had are uh, the pharma CEOs were kind of spectacularizing their responses and press releases and talking to the shareholders. But in fact, this built on 10 years of, uh, of an R&D program to do all of that work, which if, if, ha if that hadn't been done, we would have not have had COVID-19 vaccines. So ours is a uh, older technology. It's a recombinant protein technology made in yeast, the same technology used to make the hepatitis B vaccine. And, and the reason that's relevant is it's used all over the world, hepatitis B vaccine, and it's very inexpensive. So we're costing out ours around $1.50 a dose. And now uh, working with uh, Biological E in Hyderabad in India, um, Baylor Licensing made an agreement and they're now scaling up making 1.2 billion doses. And so I was told when I moved to Texas, we have to do big things. So I think that counts making 1.2 billion doses. We never made a billion of anything before and it's being tested across uh, the uh, India and in, in five sites. And it's looking really promising in laboratory animals and phase one going into phase two trials. So we're hoping we can make a big contribution on the global health front because there are not a lot of options given the fact that the mRNA vaccines probably are not gonna to filter to the low, in, low and middle income countries anytime soon. And then we're also exploring a strategy of bringing that into the US because some parents are expressing concerns about giving mRNA or adenovirus vaccines to the kids. But this technology has been used for 40 years in kids to immunize them against hepatitis B. So maybe we'll be able to come into the US as well. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, 
you know, you, so much of your work has been kind of focused on the global level and on countries with low economic resources in terms of the viruses and how it's been impacting them. But I think we saw this now in the United States of how, you know, COVID-19 has really had a disproportionate impact on our lower income and vulnerable populations. What can we do as a scientific community to help address that? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, Texas, you know, is a state of enormous power and wealth and you know, it has the, an economy the size of uh, Australia or Canada, according, according to some, maybe even Russia. But we also have quite a bit of extreme poverty. So we have a very high, what's called Gini coefficient, a disparity between the great wealth and great poverty. And poverty is such a, an important driver of uh, tropical diseases, even though we call them neglected tropical diseases, their first and foremost diseases of poverty. And that's another reason for creating the School of Tropical Medicine here is to address diseases like Chagas disease and typhus and parasitic worm infections. The interesting piece about that is wherever we've looked, we've found it, found them. So, but they're often hidden. So I think raising awareness and using the vehicle of TAMIS is, is really important. And and you know, one of the things I try to do when I'm on 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 TV is tell people about Tamist, and uh, because you know there is a lot of um, uh, I don't know if snobbery is sort of a simplistic word, but there is a lot of uh, uh, hubris about the institutions in the Northeast and in the West Coast. And I like to remind people we've got a fair bit of heft uh, here in Texas, and I and I tell people about Tamist. You know, you're right, 300. Uh, plus members of the National Academies that we can hold our own with any state in the country. And uh, there's, there's an enormous amount of uh, scientific horsepower here in our state that we, I think we could do a better job getting the word out. I think that would be the one thing I would say, because we just don't, uh, we don't like to boast about ourselves and getting the word out that the institutions that we, ha we have here in Texas are of extraordinary uh, importance to the scientific mission of the country, as well as as well as the world. Peter, uh, you know, getting to seventy five percent or whatever the number uh, needs to be a vaccinated population runs up against the challenge that some people are are anti vaxxers, if you will. And you just mentioned sort of different types of vaccines, and some people may be of a mind not to get whatever's available now, but wait for uh, something else. So what would you say uh, to people from a scientific point of view who uh, are reluctant to get a vaccine? And you know, what can we do to try to, try to get uh, as many people as possible uh, to agree to get vaccinated? So it's a great question. So uh, almost two years ago, I became a Hagler uh, Fellow Advanced Studies at, at Texas A&M. And so I've, it's given me a chance to be on the Texas A&M campus, which has been just amazing. And uh, now we've been collaborating with a group of social scientists at the at Texas A&M School of Public Health as part of that. And we just completed a survey, a pretty in-depth analysis of who's refusing vaccines uh, across the United States. And the interesting thing, it was spot on with a similar study that was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And, and the, in, in our case, the two categories of people who have a high rate of vaccine refusal or hesitancy were what are called one Trump voters and the other, the African-American community. And you're like, well, you know, that's that seems so different. Uh, and the Kaiser Family Foundation did a similar survey and what they came up with, they didn't call them Trump voters, they called them quote Republicans on a quote unquote and the African-American community. So what's going on there? And I think there's two different drivers. I think in the case, the former, you know, we saw this kind of pivot to the, um, the political extremism starting around 2015 uh, uh, with the anti-vaccine movement. And that's where it, really took off under this banner that they call health freedom, medical freedom. And that's really accelerated now across the country. And so the force, the approach you would use for that is quite different from the African-American community, which some are ascribing to 
historic and structural racism. And I think there's a component, but also the anti-vaccine groups have been specifically targeting the African-American community. They held a, been holding a series of rallies, anti-vaccine rallies in Harlem, New York uh, in, in 2019. So one of the things that I've been doing now is uh, to get everybody vaccinated. I've been uh, going on two very different types of um, uh, uh, programs and TV shows. So for to address the um, the political extremism on the right, I've been, of course I've been doing Fox News quite a bit and love the challenge of of doing that. It's been really interesting, but also doing the Daily Caller, the DC Examiner. So reaching out to conservative news sites, I think is really important to get uh, that, that part of the country vaccinated. And then going on a number of African-American talk radio shows and uh, has been equally important. And it's been, it, you know, it, it's really, it, and sometimes you have to fine tune your message, adjust your message, but it's been very satisfying to, you know, be someone who's seen as not having too much of a political agenda and willing to reach broadly across the, the country. And I think, you know, this is one of the things being down in Texas teaches you because we are such a diverse state, you know, probably the most diverse state in the country. And I think in some ways we have a, a greater tolerance for diversity and uh, support and even love for diversity here in Texas than many other part, parts of the country, which again is not the story that you hear about Texas, but that, that, that's my experience. Well, thanks, Peter, great answer. And thank you for uh, reaching out to so many different uh, uh, forms of communication. I think that's terrific. Amelie, back to you. Thank you so much. And, and uh, Peter, I think you're only sec second to Dr. Fauci. I mean, in terms of <laughs> personality. So you're, you're you, right you, up you, there. <laughs> well, you and my, you and my 90 year old mother. <laughs> Um, just wanted to share that we actually have some questions coming in from the audience. And so one of the first questions is, um, if a person has been tested positive for the virus, how long does the immunity last? Well, that's an easy one. We don't know. Um, and part of the reason we don't know is, well, for, you know, it, it, it likely depends on the severity of illness. So one of the things that we found is that those with severe illness, it's not there's a lot of variability, heterogeneity, tend to have pretty high levels of what are called virus neutralizing antibody, which as far as we can tell is probably pretty close to a correlate of protection. Those with moderate illness, middle levels, and those who are asymptomatic have low levels. And the ones with low levels due to asymptomatic or low grade symptoms tend to decline pretty quickly. So you stop seeing antibody, measurable antibodies after a period of time. The, the problem is this, that even though they may have rapidly waning antibodies, uh, they still, our, our colleague Akiko Awasaki at Yale has shown, they still have memory B cells, memory T cells, and can likely respond to vaccines. So it, it's a bit of an unknown. We do have reported cases of reinfection. There's not been many of them, but they're probably also underreported as well, especially if one or more of either the first or second was asymptomatic. So I think the antibody may be more durable than we realize, but I still think it's important to vaccinate those individuals and they're likely getting a pretty big boost uh, and, and we'll have more durable immunity as we go. Also for the vaccines, we don't, because they were released after two months of data um, in terms of safety and immunogenicity, we had to because the, the deaths that are spir spiraling out of control, we don't know what the durability of protection of these different vaccine platforms is. We've never licensed an mRNA vaccine, give it to a large population as the protection three months, three years, 30 years, same with the adenovirus vaccines. With our vaccine, it's an older technology. We have a better idea, but that's why there's gonna have to be a lot of communication uh, be uh, between the federal, between the government scientists and the public, which is not there right now. Operation Warp Speed has been a great development program but um, it never really had a communication strategy and hopefully we can start putting that in place. Peter, I've got a couple of related questions. Um, can vaccinated people still carry the virus? And related to that, do we expect to need to vaccinate people who have recovered from COVID-19? So um, the way the clinical trials were done is that if you felt sick, you notified the study coordinator. And if you met a certain list of criteria of symptoms, you were tested for COVID-19. 
And that's how you, and then you count it as a case of COVID-19. And so the studies were designed to look for immunity to symptomatic illness and even serious infection. And the vaccines did a great job of that. But in theory, an individual could be carrying uh, the COVID-19 virus in his or her upper airway shedding virus and you wouldn't know it. And so therefore we don't know for sure if the vaccine actually stops a symptomatic spread. So studies are underway to look at that. And that's important because, you know, especially in families where somebody's gotten vaccinated and the others don't. So let's say I get vaccinated, but my wife and youngest daughter who's home with me hasn't been, I'm out and about, I could be carrying the virus and then giving it to them. So for a while, I think until we sort this out, even after getting vaccinated, people are going to still need to wear masks uh, when, when out in public. And then over time, uh, we'll, we'll be able to get an answer to that. And I'm sorry, the second question was what? The second part? Um, do we still need to vaccinate uh, people who have recovered from COVID? I think they should be uh, because uh, if, if that could lead to a big boost. And as I say, we don't really have a full understanding of the durability of, of natural infection. And my guess is you're gonna see a pretty big boosting effect. So rather than getting two doses by having that first infection, it's almost like getting a third dose when you get the last one. Great, a couple of more questions, Peter, if you have time. Sure. Another, uh, based on the percent, of, uh, what percent of the vaccines that Texas has received have actually been administered and has Texas lost any of these vaccines? You know, we've had some delays in reporting, so I don't know what the latest numbers are today, um, and, but they're clearly not adequate. They're not nearly that 100,000 benchmark per day that we have to get to. So we have a lot of work uh, ahead of us, and we just have to make this our top priority because it's uh, all we have left at this point. In Houston and Harris County, we've done something now. We've opened up the Minute Maid Center uh, Minute Maid Park, uh, where the Astros play. And I visited uh, one of the vaccination centers a week or so ago at the Bayou City Center. It looked really good. Uh, so um, really well organized, but we're just going to need more of those. And that's going to be the challenge for 2021 is really expanding things at scale. Uh, one of the many, many things I admire about you, Peter, is that you speak truth to power, if you will, um, seeming uh, unworried about the consequences. And I think many of us in our careers have had a situation where we were faced with that challenge of speaking truth to power. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom for a younger or mid-career person uh, who might be doing some controversial research, the results of which some people don't like uh, from your own experience? Yeah, sometimes it takes you to a scary place. You know, when I started going on TV a lot in 2020 for COVID-19, you know, the message was, Peter, remember you're a scientist, you're a professor, just stick to the science, stick to the science. And then you started to see the disinformation campaign coming out and, and going up against anti-vaccine groups all these years. I can smell the disinformation campaign pretty far away. And, and you saw it, you know, the, dis, the downplaying of the severity of the epidemic, attributing COVID deaths to other causes, discrediting masks. And, um, and what do you do at that point? And and then I started to uh, try to disentangle it. So people accused me of being political. Well, I wasn't really being political. They were being political. My job was to disentangle uh, the reality from, from the disinformation. But it, it took me to some pretty dark places at times and it was scary. And, but you know, I felt, you know, this is why, you know, why did I get my MD and PhD and spend my whole life developing vaccines for infectious diseases? It was for this kind of moment. And the good news is I'm, you know, I'm senior, I'm a member of TAMIST, and that does not insulate me entirely, but it does protect uh, a little bit. The tougher part, I think, is for younger scientists, you know, I mean, having, uh, being able to do that. And, you know, part of the problem is we don't really encourage uh, public engagement among young scientists. You know, even I, you know, get my annual evaluation and, and like many in TAMIS, their annual evaluation form is based on your, your grants and your papers, right? And there's not a, a place on the form even for my single author books, much less, you know, TV interviews and op-ed pieces and all the things, and certainly not social media. So, you know, the message coming from 
uh, the the universities is public engagement is not necessarily a very valued activity. And if you're a young person trying to make your mark in the world in advance, especially in, in the university, that becomes a problem because it, do, it can take time. And, and I think we have to figure out a way to build incentives to make public engagement uh, important because we've learned that not having the scientists out there speaking creates a gap. Uh, and, and it's not the same as having the journalists and the filter it for you. It's, I think one of the things we learned in 2020, if there's any silver lining, is the American people liked hearing from the scientists. They, they liked the complexity. And, and one of the things we're always taught, if we do public engage, we're supposed to speak to the American people like they're in the fourth or sixth grade. And it's actually not true. People appreciate the complexity. They don't like to be spoken down to. They like hearing from scientists about their assumptions. And that's really positive. So I think there's an opportunity and I've spoken to the board of Tamist about this before for trying to build in public engagement and science communication into our doctoral or postdoctoral training. Certainly the young, a lot of the young people love it if we can just manage to figure out a way to, to do that. And that would be a great role for Tamist, I think. Well, Peter, thank you so much for those comments. And Terrence, I think that's a great topic for a future uh, conversation. And I think it would be great to bring our business partners into this too, because they face some of these uh, challenges as well. Well, Peter, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today uh, on behalf of all of us. Thank you. And thank you for all your support and your nice notes. And, and as I say, uh, I, I deeply treasure uh, Tamist and its role. And you guys have been great in your support during some very tough times in 2020 and 2021. All right. Well, thanks again.